Um, good afternoon. My name is Christina Lee, former West research curator who, together with my colleague, Cosmin Kostinash, um, curator at Bach, would like to extend a very warm welcome to everyone here on the first Saturday of the public program, Cinematic Narratives from Elsewhere, curated, in, curated to accompany the former West research exhibition at Bach, curated by Cosmin, um, titled Spacecraft Icarus 13, Narratives of, narratives of Progress from Elsewhere, which will officially open tonight at 8. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'll just give a, a short introduction on the um, group exhibition that will open after this public program um, at BAC, so at uh, um, 8 o'clock, and you're all more than welcome to, to come and see it. So Spacecraft Icarus 13, Narratives of Progress from Elsewhere, includes a number of artistic positions by international artists from different generations and broadly speaking um, reflects upon the state of our thinking of progress and on different visions for the future and models for political imagination. Um, the exhibition has its preamble in, in the dreams of progress in the visions and, and, and disillusions as well and, and resistance efforts that have characterized the Cold War era. Um, and mainly in the part of the world that fell outside and, uh, and also was caught in the middle of the, the dueling blocks of the, of the Cold War. Um, the geopolitical shifts of the, of the past 20 years have, remo have removed many of these um, of the certainties about the, the, the different directions along, along which progress was imagined. Uh, fracturing these previously dominant articulations into a kaleidoscope of, of narratives, of constructions, of, of discourses um, that were often ambivalent and uh, um, ideologically hybrid. Um, the image that accompanies the exhibition, and in a way it's a, it's a, it's a kind of a skeleton in its, uh, in its closet, um, is an allegory of, of Europe from uh, done in 1920, uh, 1924 um, and it is part of a, of a series of, of similar sculptures in the, in the main post office here in Utrecht. Um, all these statues represent um, five inhabited continents. Um, Europe is, um, well, I mean, to, to say here importantly is that this representation from 19, 1924 um, stems from, a, from an era when Europe was confident about its, its historical march towards ever greater progress and world domination. Um, very visibly you can see that the figure of Europe is holding its hands very firmly on the, on the globe. All the other allegories of the other continents do not hold anything in their hands. Um, but in the same time, it wasn't just representing itself. All the other continents were there because at that time Europe was, was seeking an uncivilized and ahistorical other in order to, to offset and to, to uh, make apparent its own progress. During the exhibition, um, the Utrecht Post Office will close down as part of a, of a nationwide program of pri privatization, which is a at its turn a part of, a, of an even wider program and, and process of dismantling the welfare state model um, that has been the, the, the very pride and the, and the main argument for the West self-representation as the bacon of, of prosperity during the Cold War era. And I would say here that the West amnesia about this fact is comparable only to its historical blindness in, in embellishing this slow but, but steady process of decay and the transition to neoliberalism as a sign of a new and different kind of progress. But set, along, <coughs> set alongside uh, these works and, and opening the show in the, in the preamble that you will see, um, as, as, referen as reference points are four fragments of films that were made before 1989, so at the, at the height of the Cold War that are all articulating and critiquing the, the notions of progress that have been defined by the Western rhetoric of, of imperialist development in the guise of modernity in Latin, Latin America and, and Asia. These cinematic ex ex excerpts by Mikhail Kalatozov, uh, Josue Kuba, by Glauber Rocha, the, the Age of the Earth, by Alejandro Khodorovsky, um, The Holy Mountain, and by Yasuzo Masumura, uh, The Blind Beast, presented within the exhibition, explore the instances in which filmmakers outside the West 
have been using cinema as a tool to provide alternative visions um, of these experiences of, 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 of resistance. Um, and I think here Christina can actually like talk more because this was in many ways the starting, um, the starting argument for um, uh, a public program that focuses on cinema. With an intention to bring these cinema cinematic illustrations to the fore based on what Cosman was referring to his in his exhibition, the film-based program Cinematic Narratives from Elsewhere focuses on the cinemas that have been produced elsewhere and stand as a testament of technological progress that came about through the processes of modernization. These films are made in resistance and outside the mainstream film industry in the West, for example, the wide world widespread of Hollywood, for example, by subverting cinematic codes, embracing revolutionary ideals, and combating the passive film watching experience of commercial bourgeois cinema. This program presents films from what was called the third world, aimed at mobilizing, politicizing, and decolonizing the minds of its viewers by focusing on historical, social, and political realities with attention to themes such as modernization, neocolonialism, neo neocolonialism, neo neocolonialism, uh, political corruption, and the clash between tradition and mater modernity in these locales. Also known as third world cinema, the, the filmic techniques and aesthetics are often reflective of the limited resources, while its content propagated the independence and social progress of developing countries and form an integral part of the process of shaping national cultural identities. The, the selection of films within this program spans from documentaries to epics and highlights the articulation of aesthetic and political concerns within the third world cinema from the 1960s to the present day. This afternoon's program, Bypasses to Modernity, considers various narratives of modernity and progress in contrast to the singular Western view. Looking at China as a case study, our afternoon will start with a lecture by renowned scholar Wang Hui, who would reflect on the circumstances in which incubated the rise of China, its understanding of its global position, on one hand needing to, to face the accumulation of socio-political socio contradictions during the past two decades, while taking into account the country's revolutionary heritage in the 20th century. Keeping with the contemplation of what some may call a revolutionary moment we are right now in 2011, the two films screened following the lecture will illustrate the inequalities towards the society's population, which is often consequential of to, the, to the turbulent processes of unequal economic development and political interests of their ruling elite. Both films stand as a historical document. Both films stand as historical documents, sketching out formative moments of the filmmakers' respective national and personal histories, and their own self-reflection on the representation of their subjectivities as filmmakers from emerging countries. Um, we are very happy to have um, the two filmmakers together with us for the screening, and here I would just give a very brief um, synopsis of the films that we will be screening today. Nick Diocampo's Revolutions Happen Like Refrains in a Song is a personal account of the February 1986 People Power Revolution that subsequently overthrew the dictatorship of Ferdinand Marcos in the Philippines through the, through the lenses of Diocampo's Super 8, Super 8 cinema, camera. The work is the finale of his trilogy which followed individuals driven to prostitution as a means to survival giving a glimpse to the disintegrating socioeconomic conditions in which prompted the historical moment and will be afforded the space for a critical revisit more than two decades later. The final film screen today, The Vampires of Poverty by Carlos Maiolo and Luis Ospina, witnesses the two filmmakers' sociological research on the impoverished characters within the changing cities of Bogota and Cali. Unve unveiling the contradictions at work within a society still structured under racist and elitist colonial heritages.
And now to to return to the to the, um, the first part of the program to the talk of Professor Wang Hui. Um, as Christina mentioned, uh, he departs from an analysis of the of the Chinese intellectual and political history of the 20th century um, that is marked by, by three key moments that have each uh, opened a new era um, that in so many ways are actually connected and dependent on the on the paradigms of the of the previous ones. So the 1911 revolution, uh, which in school in Romania we actually learned as the bourgeois democratic revolution. <laughs> Uh, the 1948 establishment of the People's Republic of China and um, open door policy, the, the, market, the uh, free market reforms that started at the end of the 70s. Uh, this intellectual history that assumes the central role of revolutionary thinking in the realm of politics in China in the 20th century, um, and in no lesser way, though sometimes less obvious in the rest of the world, Professor Wang Hui asked for a similar ethos in thinking about China's future. Uh, even when new intellectual bases need to be established for, for, for rethinking, well, uh, a path to progress. Um, in this sense, um, China is not a particularity, uh, but one of the most obvious models for a certain history in the making um, <clears throat> that has a universal relevance. Um, and in putting together today's program, um, and indeed the, the exhibition, um, the spirit of universalism was the key in, in, in choosing this otherwise disparate and, and perhaps idiosyncratic uh, cases, um, like an, an exemplary uh, experience of, of, of modernity, um, the um, um, idealist phase and, and, and also like the fa failures of a, of, of a people's revolution that so early indeed uh, reflects on, on, on um, the events of this year. I think both the idealism and the different levels of disappointment um, but yeah, I mean, without further ado, I would just like to introduce Professor Wang Hui um, and then to give him the floor. Um, so he teaches at the Department of Chinese Literature, uh, Chinese Language and Literature of the Tsinghua University in Beijing. His research is focuses uh, his research is focused on contemporary Chinese literature and intellectual history. He was the executive editor with Huang Ping of Du Shu magazine, uh, which is one of the leading intellectual magazines of China. The US magazine Foreign Policy named him as one of the top 100 public intellectuals in the world in May 2008. Professor Wang Hui is the recipient of many awards for his um, scholarship and has been visiting professor at Harvard, Bologna, Stanford, UCLA, Berkeley, and the University of Washington, among others. He authored dozens of books, articles, and public uh, statements, uh, of which I, would, I will name only a few. Um, in Chinese, from an Asian perspective, the nar narrations of Chinese history in 2010 for alter alternative voices, depoliticized politics, the rise of modern Chinese thought, um, and re rekindling frozen fire, the paradox of modernity. And among his books translated into English include the forthcoming, or is it already out, The Rise of Modern Chinese Thought, um, The End of Revolution, China and the Limits of Modernity, um, and China's New Order, Society, Politics, and Economy in Transition. So I would like to invite Professor Wang Kui and to wish you all an uh, in interesting and challenging afternoon. Thank you very much. I'm really happy to be here. To thank you, the uh, Christina and the Cosme, for inviting me to this very interesting exhibition and uh, and uh, talk to chat with the, the artists is quite unusual for me. It's uh, basically I'm an intellectual historian, so most of the the, the occasion is about the uh, more or less academic uh, rather than. But it's uh, really uh, enlightened because I went to the exhibition itself. It's so interesting. Full of the, the, uh, the ideas about the future, but it can also be traced back to the history, like uh, the, the historians. So this is a very <laughs> interesting. But the, as the, uh, the, the historian used to say that the history, sometimes the most unpredictable, almost like the, the future were the same, the, uh, it's unpredictable too, so the, the same, same stories. 
So today I would, I will talk about the, something about the about China, and because now the China became the the, the hot topic everywhere. It's quite a different from the ten years ago. It's very little about the China, but now everybody talk about China. Among Chinese, it's a lot of the debates about China too. And uh, last year, uh, last years. Uh, there were a lot of the discussions about China, which in the I in my title I use that the 30 years, 60 years, 100 years. Why that the, I why I choose this title is because the uh, 2009, uh, uh, 2008 it was the 30 years anniversary of Chinese reform, and the 2009 is the 60 years anniversary of the PRC the People's Republic of China. This year is the 100 years anniversary of 1911. So the, the revolution, the first Chinese revolution. So basically, my uh, definition is that the 20th century for China is uh, exactly a short 20th century. Almost started from 1911 revolution to the end of the Cultural Revolution, which means that there is a long revolution but a short century. So the 20th century ended almost by the end of the Cultural Revolution, that the revolution ended China on another track towards now the so called globalization, marketization, and so on and so forth. So that's the, uh, the, the, the basic backgrounds for these. And uh, I think that the look back to the 20th century, for me, the two questions are crucial for understanding, in the understanding of the Chinese history. One is that the China, maybe, is the only one country is that the pre-20th century agrarian empire still not split into different nations, basically is the uh, maintain its unity of that the population and the territory and the basic political structure were there. So lo after the Soviet Union collapsed, these kind of the, the experience almost disappeared now. Of course, a lot of historians now argue that the nation state is not a, is a kind of the fiction. Is a, even now, the, if you look at the, the, what happened in the Amer America or the EU or some uh, Britain or some is still the certain kind of the format of empire were there, but this is a tip, uh, more or less tip, quite uh, different. It's a based based on the industrialization, not came directly came back from the pre twenty or the pre nineteenth century, the history. So this is a Chinese. Why China can maintain that the, the basic, the framework of that. This is the, the, the real question, and I think that for, not only for China, but for the world history. Second question is also quite crucial in understanding the contemporary Chinese history. That is why the, uh, we know that the, uh, one of the phenomena in the world history was, was the rise of the socialism, or the socialist systems in the 20th century. That going to be it was going to be ended around the 1989, and from 1989 to 1991 or two, almost the whole system collapsed. We we remember that the protest and the, the movements started. Of course, there were different traces from the 60s and later on, or the in in the 50s in Hungary, 60s in Czechoslovakia, or some other in Poland. But that moment in the late 80s started from Tiananmen Square. Why it was after that a serious moment happened in different socialist countries and the Soviet Union collapsed. And together with the collapse of the Eastern European bloc, why it was China remained politically, basic political structure unchanged. However, the political framework is unchanged under this given condition. The great transformation in economic uh, so, uh, social transformation happened. So this is a very par uh, paradoxical 
unexpected consequence, not only the, for the observers outside of China, but the, uh, for a lot of the Chinese intellectuals frustrated by the fact. Because remember that in the early 90s, so many predictions to talk about the collapse of China, that the collapse of China will happen in three months, half months, half year, three year, five year, ten year, and then it suddenly the, the issue of rise of China happened everywhere. They talk about that. The, and the Af China in Asia, China in Africa, China in Latin America became the topics everywhere. So this is the, the great change, and the, the, uh, which means that the, most of us were not able to answer that question in the last decades. So how to explain that? And that also raised the questions, the challenges for our understanding of history, the 20th century history. That's the, I think the, I raised the two basic questions to rethink about the 20th century China. So one of the crucial, actually the issue, the point, is that how to evaluate the role of Chinese revolution. I think this is a quite a crucial, and it's a post-revolutionary development. Because most of the, of course, in the circles of the academia, as well as in the field of arts, I think the, uh, a lot of people employ the post-colonial uh, post uh, the theory to interpret the contemporary the culture phenomena. But in a sense, the Chinese situation is more or less a lot of the post-colonial phenomena, but basically is how to explain the post-revolutionary developments. Because China was, uh, in terms of Mao, say the semi-feudal, semi-colonial, uh, but not never was a full colonial uh, uh, colonies in, in that the 19th and the 20th century. That's the, the basic background for that. So that's what I, why I try to understand this question and what's the new challenge, what's the transformation in the post the revolutionary era? What's the relationship between the Chinese revolution and the new developments? So this is the, my the basic questions I want to. I, how many minutes? A long time I should. Uh, <laughs> 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40 minutes, which means that uh, it's about, uh, yes, I stop me just Any, anyway because we're talking about the 100 years <laughs> it's, uh, I can't stop any moment of that history but history could be cut off sometimes but the renewed again so uh, so it's because of the uh, that, that the, the topic of the uh, we, we know that the Christina already mentioned that the two Faces of the, the so-called the rise of, modern, uh, of China. On the one hand, it is a huge economic growth. It's in the last decades, it's a more than 10% uh, GDP growth. That the made China already became the second economy after the America. According to the World Bank and the IM, F, the most of the indicators show that in the next decades, maybe 15 years or 20 years, China will become the second, uh, the, the biggest, the first economy, surpass the America to be the first economy. This is a huge growth, especially among the third world countries. These kind of development, nevertheless, it's uh, attract a lot of tensions. So a lot of the uh, criticism over China, but if you look at, if you're living in Latin America and the Africa, is a paradoxical feeling for this, because a lot of the, also the why such a country can achieve such a growth so quickly. This is on the one hand. Second is on the other hand is a huge contradictions accumulated following that growth. Basically, we can summarize the into the social differentiation between the poor and the rich, that the Gini index <coughs> shows that the how unequal in China, now the, the social relations. Second is that the, the widening of the gap between the, the urban area and the uh, rural area still continued. The third aspect is, is that the, the, the widening of the gap or the differentiation between the coast area and the inland area, the regional difference was huge, still the huge. 
as well as the ecological price. It's uh, the, the environmental crisis happened in China. It's, it's a, a lot of the, the, the problems. So I try to answer these kind of the questions by tracing back to the history. Why China can achieve that such, such growth and but as well as what kind of alternative to these developments, the mode of developments. I think that the, the most of the, uh, the, the, the uh, difficult issue is about the political structure. A lot of the criticism focuses on the political structure of China. So in the Western media, they use, uh, quite often we find that the terms like uh, authoritarian regime and so on and so forth. And they, treat, they, they thought that there's a contradiction between why China, on the one hand, developed the market economy, on the other hand, remained authoritarian in the political. But look back to the history of capitalism, it's quite uh, not really new, not special for China is the, uh, the, the capitalist development always needs certain kind of political structure there. So this is the, the historical aspect. Only because of the post-Cold uh, War era that a new ideology em emerged and they thought this is a totally different story. But it's not the real the new story. It's the older story to some extent. But the, for the Chinese case, it's still a little bit different from other the old the, the stories, partly because the Chinese political system came from the revolution. It's not came from the colonial power, early capitalist system, but the real socialism, so-called a socialist state. So how that the, 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 we can talk about these kind of the questions. So uh, a lot of people has uh, focus on this issue, then I, I started from this issue. Why it was China after the 1989 remained stable compared to the, uh, the other Eastern European uh, countries. Yesterday we chat about the Romania and the Yugoslavia. These two countries are among the uh, Eastern Euro European bloc, so quite a special. It's trying to keep the distance certain distance from the Soviet Union. And I tried to, but the, somehow the, the, the scale of the country is, is, a, is not that big like China. But something else didn't happen in these countries like in China. So that's what I think tried to not talk about, the, talk about the particular, I mean not talk about the particularism, but talk about the special experience with the universal implication for these. First of all, China shared a lot of the problems with the former Soviet Union system, that the, like the bureaucracies and the special interest groups within the socialist systems. But uh, why that uh, when we talk about the post-1989 developments, we need to know that uh, how can explain the collapse of the, uh, the Eastern European bloc. I just uh, I couldn't uh, talk too much about this. But uh, in, um, in his memoir of the, the fall of 1989 by Egon Krinz, the last part, Communist Party secretary of Germany, unfortunate figure, <laughs> Who, who said that uh, how could uh, our country collapse so dramatically in a very short period? He said that uh, he recalled a term, quite an interesting term. He said that the, in the 70s, actually the 60s, 70s, the Western leaders used to employ a term to describe the nature of sovereignty in the Eastern European bloc. That's a so-called Bonnet-Genève doctrine. What's the Bernie Genève doctrine? Which means that the incomplete sovereignty, means that the any, any substantial political decision should be decided not in Berlin, but in Moscow. Or it's not in any other capitals of those countries, but in Moscow. So once the transformation or anything happened in Moscow, there were sequential effects in those countries. So that's why the Egon Krinsk, uh, blamed, he, he blamed the Gorbachev for the collapse of, of, of the, the Eastern European uh, countries. Partly, I think it's right. 
but we can go further to answer the question of it because a lot of people talking uh, uh, had the reflection on the nation state or the sovereign countries, the sovereignty issues. Egon Kearns also raised the question, he said that the, but when the Western leaders uh, accuse us uh, as an uh, incomplete sovereignty and the things we are in the alliance, in the ally, is, which means that the, always the, the sovereignty was the incomplete. So not only the, for the Eastern European countries, but also for the Western European countries are the same. The only difference was we felt the West won the, the whole Cold War. So this is the, his the, the explanation. So he obviously he tried to find the excuse for that, avoid to mention that the deep construction, that the contradictions within that systems had in, in the Eastern blocs. But nevertheless, I think there was something can help us to understand what, what's the position of China during the Cold War. Because we know that the PRC was established in 1949, after the Civil War. And after the, uh, the, the Civil War, Chinese Communist Party was in power and uh, decided to be aligned with the Soviet Union, part of the, the Eastern Bloc. So the first years of the, uh, the, 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 the of PIC, its relationship with its, its relation to the Soviet Union, looks like a Soviet relationship. So basically, the Soviet invested a lot for the Chinese industrialization, every aspect, including the arts. You see that in the fifties, a lot of the Soviet Union, the, the artists that, that were invited to China to teach in the, uh, the Central Academy of Fine Arts. They are the follow that the, the technologies. But in the mid 50s, the, after the first five years plan, internationally, one thing happened. That's the very important issue that the Bandung Conference, we know that the, the Bandung Conference. That's one of the, the, the beginning of the Third World Campaign, international the, the campaign in the world history. And the China actively involved in the Bandung Conference. We know that the, the Zhou Enlai worked with Nehru and the, all those the, the leaders from the Third World countries together, tried to have the intervention into the polar structure of the Cold War. Of course, Basically, that the Bandung Conference, behind that, according to the recent memoirs by, like, for example, Samia Amin and some others, they highlight that the, the backgrounds, that there was a very strong intervention from the Communist Party countries. But basically, this is a kind of intervention into that the polar structure. Where if we talk about the end of the Cold War, and maybe we need to trace back to that moment is to, to, to define that at the end of the Cold War as a long process, which means that the collapse, the gradual collapse of the Cold War structure is uh, the polar structure, the both power dominated by the Soviet Union and America. So this is the, 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 uh, the, the issue. Before the Bandung Conference, we know quite familiar from the, uh, the early 50s, uh, China had the war in the Korean Peninsula with America. And that kind of the conflicts continued to the 70s in Vietnam and every front in the world. But in the late 50s and early 60s, China had the public debates with the Soviet Union. And that made China were brick with that alliance, the, the Soviet Union, made the whole issues more independent, made the whole nature of the state more independent. So this is the, 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 the if we talk about the, uh, uh, the, the sovereign issues, that the international relations happened politically, not defined in the sense of the uh, nominal, it's a, a normative the sense of the international relations to talk about the sovereignty, but talking about the independent nature of the country in the political process. So that's why that, uh, I think China became quite special <coughs> among the socialist countries, especially the geopolitical position in the East Asia. So this is a quite a different from Yugoslavia and uh, Romania. 
Second, I think that the, these process started from the end of the 50s of the bit, public debates between China and the Soviet Union, which was not happened only because the two countries, but also started from the, uh, the political debates. So that started from the communist parties, between the communist parties. And one of the uh, domestic consequences or the result was the launch of the Cultural Revolution. So the Cultural Revolution broadly thought as a disaster, the, the, catastrophe, the catastrophe. But on the other hand, certain kind of the unexpected sequence happened following that one. So on the one hand is that during the Cultural Revolution, we know that the, what was destroyed or the destructed hugely, that was the structure of the party and the state. So the, the, the bu whole bureaucracy was broken. <laughs> so the different ranks of officials were sent by Mao to the countryside and the factories. So this is the, the kind of, the, that's why after the Cultural Revolution, all those people blamed that the experience. But unexpected the consequence on the one, uh, the, the on one hand is that uh, those people high rank officials, they, they live for certain years in a lower social strata. They became quite familiar with the demands of the ordinary people. So that's why even Deng Xiaoping came back from Jiangxi, he could able to launch the reform in order to make response to the demands of the lower social strata from below rather than from above. So the, the early, the beginning of the socialist reform so-called it really came from actually the, the early experience, but talk about it is a, the, 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 the tragic history in a, during the Cultural Revolution. This is the one hand. On the other hand, here we're quite familiar with that because the several phases of Cultural Revolution. On the one phase, phase domestically, is quite a suppressive for the, especially for the elites, political elites. But on the other hand, there were certain kind of the interaction between the 1968, the student movements everywhere in the world, and its interaction with China. So that's a, create a certain kind of international atmosphere. So although the judgment, the basic judgments about the uh, 60s were quite different, nevertheless, this period for China was quite uh, crucial. Because the, 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 the Chinese reform launched against the background of so-called total negation of cultural revolution. Without that, the total negation of cultural revolution is almost not possible to explain the legitimacy of the Chinese reform. So this is the, the, the interaction between the, the more dialectical, trialectical, <laughs> the, the consequence of that. So that never happened in other socialist countries. I think that's uh, the, uh, the, the big... But following that, but following that is, uh, you know, the whole total negation of cultural revolution became the grand narrative of a successful story of the Chinese reform, which means that the negation of the whole 20th century. And the negation of the whole century is means that the certain kind of the... Uh, new legitimacy emerged, that's a new liberal ideas. That's a, that's a new liberal domination, or the doctrines actually came from overlaps with the total negation of the Cultural Revolution and the whole 20th century in China. So that's also explained that even for the official policy in a certain period, never, no one to touch upon the issue of social justice that served to the social differentiation in the last decade. So this is a very contradictory and a paradoxical situation. Historically speaking, it's difficult to understand the, 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 the new status of China in these contemporary context. Because look back to the, 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 the some, if you read some summaries or reflections of the uh, Chinese the reform, by foreign observers, for example, like uh, Joseph Stiglitz, who published an article, quite an interesting article, entitled the Post-Washington Consensus Consensus. And uh, to get another 
the young scholar Yoshia Rimo, who published an article on entitled the Beijing Consensus. Basically, they talk about why China uh, can avoid, to some extent, the experience of Argentina or some other neoliberal crisis. Although, from my point of view, China has overlapped a lot of aspects of the neoliberal problems. But certain kind of those people argue that the China were quite much more independent. And the role of the state in managing of the marketization was much more ex effective than other those countries. So, but that kind of the, uh, the legacy came from early history rather than the contemporary the, the transformation. But the, basically, as we, without the, 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 the understanding of the, the Chinese revolution and the socialist period, it's difficult to understand why the role of the state in China can be understood in such a way. It's almost not possible. So this is a, the, at the same time, we know that the, the so-called open door policy. We usually talk about the, the uh, beginning of the Chinese reform started from the end of the 70s. But on the other hand, we know that the, the, uh, the, the, these kind of the narration itself is problematic. Because on the one hand, that the, the, the open door policy started the, even the, the improvement of the relationship between China and the, the Western countries, especially the America, started from the beginning of the 70s, during Mao and the Zhou Enlai's time, rather than the later times not mention the, the, the strong interaction between China and the third world countries during the 60s and the 70s. Even started the only started from the, uh, the Western point of the view, we talk about the Chinese development, we can over, overlook that aspect of early developments in the 60s and the 70s. So this is the, 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 uh, the, uh, one of the, the backgrounds. At the same time, the, uh, not only the issue of the, uh, the PRC, but also why the 1911 revolution still the matters. The one issue that uh, the, uh, the issue of the rural revolution, the land revolution, started from the, uh, the slogans of the redistribution of land, started from 1911 revolution. That of the first president of Sun Yat-sen was an early revolutionary who raised the issue of that uh, so-called uh, certain kind of the socialism were necessary for the establishment of the Republic of China after the collapse of the, uh, the last dynasty. And uh, the, he didn't fulfill that uh, task. However, the whole 20th century, actually one of the most important uh, phenomena was the land relations transformation. It's quite uh, important. On the one hand, uh, the redistribution of land to the hands of the, uh, the peasants. And then we under, underwent the process of the people's commune, the collectivization of the, uh, the, the, the land. And then by the end of the 70s, we had the, the uh, redistribution of land to the household, the, the different families. Basically, the, the people treat that the reform as a negation of the early revolution, because it's a negation of the collectivization. However, that the redistribution to characteristics of the redistribution of land need to be highlighted. On the one hand, that the redistribution based on the concept of the collective ownership of land. Until now, although the land was dis distributed to the peasants, the rural land, the Chinese land system, divided two kinds of the systems. The urban land belonged to the state, the state ownership. And the rural land, it's a collective. Local communities have the ownership. But the, the whole management, the right for the management, belonged to the family. So this is the one aspect. Second aspect is that these land redistribution starting point is quite equal. Because in the 70s, after the collectivization of land, that made the state was able to redistribute the land equally to the, each families. That makes sense. I think that the, it especially compare the experience of China with some 
other countries without the land reform, maybe South, South Asian countries, maybe Philippines is another case. Because if you look at what happened in India, Nepal, and the other South Asian countries, together with some Latin American countries, together with the Philippines, I think that these countries in the 20th century, the land reform never completed. So that I think the, uh, we know that the certain kind of the rise of the Maoism, the military arms struggle, still alive in these countries, like a Maoism campaign in, 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 in central India and in Nepal, and all these areas, the social conflicts are still related to the issue of land issue. But that in the East Asia countries, most of East Asian countries, in different ways, that kind of the questions basically resolved. But the new question em emerged because of the ownership that the collective or the state own that allow the developers together with the local governments can actually abuse that, that their power to, to the grabbing, to, to grab the, the, the lands. So this is a, the, a lot of the stories. Most of the, uh, we know that the, um, in each year, we have the uh, 80,000 protests. Different, it's a, a, even according to the official the, 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 the numbers. 60% of that happened in, in the countryside. Most of them related to the land issues. This is because of the urbanization, because of the, the land issue the, the developing. So that's why the issue about the land was still the crucial issue for China. So on the one hand, you need uh, equal relations. But on the other hand, especially the, the, the country like China was populated, is so dense populated. And uh, still we have about the 60% uh, rural population, which means that in the near next decades, it's almost not, not possible for China to simply follow the way of the advanced countries, so-called capitalist countries, the basic the urbanization that could for another kind of the, uh, the consequence. And uh, if you look, if you visit China, like uh, the suburb or the, the um, uh, frontier of the urban area, a lot of the semi slums em emerged in that area. So what kind of the, uh, the new relations of land became a big issue. That's why at this moment in China, there was a hot debate on the so-called the uh, Canton model and the Chongqing model. The Canton model, much more marketization, integration of countryside and urban area, and uh, basically the rural relations disappeared almost. In the Chongqing area is another, it's also for the uh, urbanization, it's a huge, city, but still in that city defined by the state, we had more than 60, about 70, 60 to 70 percent of the population were peasants. So they tried to use the land budget, the finance, to support the change of identification of the rural residents to the urban residents. And they used that the land, especially is an additional, additional value of land to support the build of the public housing and uh, allow the, the poor peasants to live into that, the, 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 the low rent publishing, uh, public housing system. So this is the, the whole the, the, uh, 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 issues. Basically, I think look back to the, uh, the, the whole 20th uh, century, as I said, that the, on the one hand, it was a short 20th century if they're talking about the Chinese Revolution from 1911 revolution to the end of the 70s. But the, it was a long revolutionary period. So the, the social mobilization was, was, was huge. It's, it's very difficult to imagine any other societies, even in the 20th century for the revolutionary era, such a huge mobilization happened because Generally speaking, even you compare it to the revolutions in Russia or other re regions, the revolutionary era itself is much shorter 
there is, it looks like a sudden incident of like an October Revolution in Russia. There you establishment of the new uh, the, the Soviet public. But in, in, in Chinese case, it's uh, through the whole culture, uh, the, 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 the military and the, 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 the revolutionary, the mobilization in the whole, 20, the whole century. So that's why I think it's a, a very important. Uh, this is a, when you talk about when I talk about these uh, uh, the, the so-called the early empire, why that uh, can still maintain is a, is a certain kind of the unity. Without that, the, the long 20th century or the short 20th century is difficult to understand because we know that the, after the 11th revolution, China almost collapsed. Civil war, warlords and the regional separation and a lot of the things happened until the invasion of the Japan. So this is a kind of the, uh, the, the uh, uh, this kind of the, the, the history. But all these issues, let me summarize of, of these some characteristics of the, the, the 20th century. One is that the very special nature of the state not only in the third world countries, but also in the socialist countries, it's quite a special. And secondly, because of it's really the, 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 conce the sequence of the Chinese revolution. And it's also defined the nature of the Communist Party and the political structure there. And the, second, it, uh, the third is aspect is uh, the quite important. Both Chinese revolution and the Chinese reform started from the rural change. The peasants played a crucial role in the whole both, period, both periods. If you look at what happened in, for example, in Europe, the migrants, Chinese migrants, a lot of migrants came from Wenzhou, and those people, the small businessmen, actually were the peasants. Most of them, they are not the, the urban citizens. They're the, uh, the, 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 the peasants, both revolutionaries and the reform era that the peasants played a crucial role in China. So this is a, without the understanding of 20th century China, it's also very difficult to understand. However, from my point of view, all these kind of the, uh, the very special status transformed now. On the one hand is that we know that the the, uh, the, the China has integrated, so-called integrated into the global system. And uh, the following the whole globalization and the regionalization. And uh, especially the Chinese economy became so-called uh, the exportation-oriented economy. The had the huge the foreign reserve and the American national debt. So that's why Neil Ferguson used the term of the so-called Chair America that made the whole Chinese economy quite uh, risky now. It's very, on the one hand, it looks very strong, but on the other hand, full of the risks within. This, uh, that cannot be resorted to the early idea of so-called sovereignty to deal with, because the whole situation changed. But certain kind of autonomies is necessary. Is what kind of, of autonomies in open conditions work with others? can develop that became the one of the challenges for China. So this is the, the one. Second is that the, the, the Communist Party is under the transformation. Although the political structure looks stable and unchanged, but look at into, inside of the political structure, a huge transformation happened. I summarize that in another, uh, the, my book on depoliticization. I use the term of the statification of political parties in, uh, for the describe, description of that of the nature. Because generally speaking, the party state was the nature. When we talk about the early so-called, it's not the only the sovereignty, but the political nature of that the state. It came from the party and its relation to the state. But now following the whole change, the party gradually integrated into the framework of the state. It's more or less functionalistic rather than ideological or the based on the political values. Some people perceive that as a progress because it's a Cold War, end of the Cold War following that. But on the other hand, which means that the, the, these political elites 
and they lost their representativeness of the mass. So they are, because the communist movement claimed that they are representative of the interest of the, uh, the working class. But now the social differentiation became huge. The gap, gap or the social stratification of the whole society was is so divided. In that sense, what kind of the political agenda for the ruling class? That became a big issue. If you look at the slogans raised by communist party, three representatives, or the so-called the, the harmonious societies, it's nothing to do with the representativeness of the interest from the lower social strata. So that caused the issue of the political crisis and what's the legitimacy, new legitimacy was, can be employed. That is a big, big issue. When the, uh, the start of the Chinese reform, Deng Xiaoping raised the issue, say, allow the people, some people, became the uh, rich, richer, the first. At that time, no resistance almost, because they simply thought that the Communist Party represented the whole interest of the working class. But if now the leaders raise the same issue, nobody believed that, right? It's a big, given the reality of the social differentiation. So the social justice and equality is big issues. The last aspect was that the, uh, the, the China followed the mode of the developments, quite uh, not, not so many specific, because uh, ecological issues and a lot of the crisis happened, which obviously showed that these kind of the pattern of developments has a quite a strong unsustainable aspect of that development. You need to change that the mode of the production, mode of the development. And that became the challenge. On the one hand, you need to improve the, the, the gap between poor and the rich. And a, a lot of the demands for being richer. But on the other hand, you need a more sustainable development. That became a contradictory demand for that. It's a huge challenge for China and that the transformation of mode of the development. So all these issues, and uh, related to the, another aspect of the issue of the, the so-called participation or the participated democracy, the people, how can people involve in the policy making process? How different people can really have the voice, especially from the lower social strata, have their own voice in the public sphere? in the political public sphere became the uh, crucial issue. So that the, uh, the, the challenge became even more uh, serious because in the 80s, for example, uh, the, my generation, we were in Tiananmen, for example, we protest. We thought that the, the model was existed there. It's like America or like uh, Europe. However, now is all the models were in crisis sometimes even deeper, then how can we invent it? Certain kind of a new path for the future became the common challenge, not only for China, but also for the whole world. That's why I stop here for the interaction, okay? Thank you so much, Professor Wong, for your um, very insightful analysis of the past century in, in China. And I think uh, this also ties into a lot of the thinking that we are always we're having, especially me as someone from Hong Kong, was looking at the situation in, in um, Egypt, for example, and the notion of revolution comes back quite a lot. And then, of course, we all followed a little bit of the Jasmine Revolution and also the kind of failed attempts in China and how it's being these voices of dissent are always being suppressed. And it always seems to be this kind of tension moment and everyone's waiting, when is it going to happen? Is there going to be change? Is everyone so blindsided with being earning money or, 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 politic, or, or economic development? What would you see as, is there a possibility of change from like, for example, the people? That's, that's a question I would like to ask you. Okay, I uh, answered the, uh, the so, uh, this is a question not, not really easy 
answered actually. Sounds like we have a lot of the answers, but not easy. The first of all, all these difficulties, all the challenges happened and it became related to each other. What happened in Egypt or Tunisia or other places now in in, in New York and Washington and in several weeks ago in London, no? that all that happened here and there. So just mean revolution, if that is a proper term, is happened everywhere. So in China, it's different stories, I think. Everybody expected that what happened in China. It didn't. But they didn't happen, they didn't expect it to happen in Wall Street or the Washington that happened. So why that's the reason I think that we really need to change the logic to, to, to understand the question. On the one hand is a control, the, 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 the answer was the, the control. But on the other hand it's not the, simply the control. Because we know that according to the reports, the, uh, even the, uh, the, the official, the, 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 as I mentioned, that uh, 80,000 protests a year in, in, in China happened here and there. But why it is not it, like a Jasmine Revolution type, that type of happening in China? So this is the, the difference. I think that we really need to understand that the, what's the real substance, substantial difference between China and Egypt or other countries. Basically, I think that on the one hand, the most of the media focus on the political structure. Is it because it clear uh, distinction between authoritarian regime and a democratic system? That the, the whole idea of just mean revolution happened in that the distinction. You, you, you see that? However, these kind of distinction, what happened in London and what happened in, in the Wall Street or what happened in China, will also show that these kind of the old pattern of distinction lost its some uh, the, uh, capacity for the explaining of these the, 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 uh, incidents. That's, I think, it's uh, quite uh, uh, important. Basically, as I said, most of the, uh, the, the protests happened in China related to the issues of like land issues, unemployment and so on and so forth, and also the migration and the ecological crisis. All, all, all these things happened in this way. One of the aspects of Chinese reform, I think that uh, compared to Egypt and uh, other, some other third world countries, the reduction of poverty in China was massive. I have to say that uh, compared to the early period, according to a lot of the other numbers, the, uh, the, the, the reduction of the basic is, uh, the, 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 the poverty is massive. So that, if you look at uh, Cairo, and a uh, whole percentage, a huge percentage of the uh, absolute poor people, poverty there, and you see that the, 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 that kind of the radical differentiation a little bit of difference. So, and at this time, what happened in the Wall Street or the suburb of the Paris or London is also related to the same process. And China also happened in the same pattern in this way. But it's up to whether or not you can manage that more social equal relations. I think this is the, 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 the one issue. Second is a political aspect. That I think, I, I think that, that we need to rethink about the idea of democracy itself. Because basically, the democracy as a value was very important for the change of our country. But on the other hand, the idea of the democracy, if you only focus the, on the formalist views, it is difficult to explain the situation. I give you the, the one of the example, the quite uh, famous order uh, of the end of history, Francis Fukuyama, who wrote an essay recently to to a little bit uh, regret, not uh, regret, the, the, a little bit apological. Not the, the, the history didn't end it uh, as he expected uh, decades ago, <laughs> and uh, but he especially he then then he. He mentioned, he visited China, 
And uh, he, obviously, Chinese, on the one hand, the growth, because those people were more neoliberal idea about the economy, have to be appreciated about the, what happened in China. Not the, from left wing, they are more critical, but the, the, this kind of growth, they are welcome. So in that sense, they have to give some credit to China. Uh, so in his article, it's quite an interesting article in any way. He said that uh, China is, for example, had the, some positive developments. And uh, then he have to explain the political aspect of that. He said that uh, on the one hand, Chinese government is sometimes is suppressive sometimes. Surprised the, the, the rebellions, for example. But on the other hand, he said the Chinese government, compared to many countries, are more, is more reactive to the demands of the society. So they were more flexible for change the policy, improve something. That uh, not the pre, it's, it's somehow, it's more, he said that it's even more responsive. Not only then the governments in like uh, in Asia, but also even more reactive to uh, compared to the European governments. Many European governments, uh, for example, the the performance of the governments in the financial crisis. By the end of the the essay, he also lists the the the, the, the countries as authoritarian countries. Obviously, China is among those countries. He, he talked about the Russia, Iran, China, of course, North Korea. But the problem is that Russia and Iran had the uh, presidential and the parliamentary election. They, has, they have the multi-party system. The basic political structure more or less formally democratic. However, on the other hand, we still thought that it was quite suppressive and authoritarian, which also shows that the, the old standards to evaluate the level of the democratic level were became problematic. So on the one hand, you can argue that the one country was more responsive means that a certain kind of the channels, the voices from lower can be heard. Otherwise, how that the policy making process can be changed. But on the other hand, politically, the system itself were quite different. So these became the, 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 the issue. China, on the one hand, needs the more formal, like a rule of law, and a certain kind of introduction of election in different levels. On the other hand, I think that the 20th century Chinese history reminds us certain kind of the mobilization, integration, and the participation were so important in the public policy making in order to improve the, the, the social issues. That what, what, that's why I say that the stratification of party was dangerous. Because which means that a certain kind of the group of political elites detached from the whole society, and the main, that's the new mechanism of suppression, were different from the older mechanism of suppression, but looks quite similar. So in that way, we need to rethink about our political perspective. I mean, to, to start where we can re-understand the current situation both in China and uh, elsewhere. Yeah, please. I have a question. Um, the okay, good. You said at the end of your presentation, uh, you talked about the 80s generation and the aspirations uh, and the uh, hopes, perhaps, of the 80s generation that was demonstrating at Tiananmen. <coughs> And, and then you seemed to be saying that the aspirations and the hopes and the uh, investment of emotion and, and hope for the future of that generation was misguided. Because in your analysis, of course, of what has happened since then, you, you can now say 
that the models that that generation was, was looking at with hope and aspiration, the European and the American model, were also not without their problems. And this is, un this is understandable from today's perspective. But would you still say that those aspirations of democracy and participation and rule of law that the generation of the 80s had, would you still say that they were misguided? Um, I can answer this question geolectical <laughs> in your term, Nikki. Uh, on the one hand, it's quite important because that the, 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 the issue is that the political enthusiasm disappeared following the marketization. You know, this is the, the way the in, and uh, that the, the uh, certain kind of spirit of the publicity in the 80s, my generation was so strong. So we, we prepared to involve things, not to for ourselves, it's really the public, certain kind of that kind of spirit. That became the resources for the critical spirit. I think that, that in that sense, the essence of that spirit is the democratic. Not necessarily the model itself. Because the, uh, the whole, if you look at the whole history, what the so-called the, the, the great transformation, new liberal great transformation started from the 70s. And we, we even can reflect it. We never conscious of that what happened in the seven, late 70s and early 80s in China. How we can relocate that the change in the global context. For us, simply no answers. This, this is the, the, the win. Second, I think that the, the late 80s, although it's to, towards the end of the Cold War, but the spirit, even the spirit of democracy was embedded with a certain kind of the Cold War mentality. So it's a, it's a total negation itself. is very problematic. Because the, uh, now we can realize that, the, how that the total negation of Chinese revolution exactly served to the great transformation for this kind of the huge social differentiation. Why that the value of equality, social justice, which was the basic value for the whole 20th century, disappeared for that period. And that, I think, is quite important. I'm not saying it completely disappeared, but a certain as a legacy was still there. So quite interesting, because, for example, I did some investigation involving some social movements in the countryside, both in the countryside and the industrial sectors. Those protests, if you look at what happened in China, those protests, mainly the slogans and the values came from the early socialist era, rather than the new era. But the meaning or the implication changed the following the context. They're talking about that we are the master of our society. That's the slogan for the equality at the, for the working class in the 20th century but the for forgotten during the late 80s, after the, especially the 90s, when only in that the social protests, these kind of the slogans re-emerged. And we found that the that legacy was still meaningful for us. This is the one issue. Second, I mentioned that the, 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 the Francis Fukuyama thesis, he talked about the responsive. <coughs> he talked about the responsiveness of the state it started from his perspective of the certain kind of the statist perspective. They could only understand the function of the state in governing of the market and so on and so forth. But he actually didn't understand what's the political dynamic for that, why that the, 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 the state or the governmental policy could be responsive to some extent. Partly because that legacy became containing or containing power from within the regime because Chinese government, Chinese state after the 1989 for, for some reason compared to other the Eastern European countries, they negated the Cultural Revolution but not negated the whole Chinese Revolution 
for the reason of legitimation of the rule, ruling, right? However, that, uh, that gives the certain space for the criticism or for the balance from within. The people will argue even when the people use the old slogan against the new policy. For the policy makers, they are all feel difficult to deal with. So in that sense, the socialist legacy became a certain kind of the power balance there. This is a political dynamic that made the policy makers to some extent more responsive, to some extent only, because of that the depoliticization process was really deep, so not always responsive. But if you want to explain why some point of view they're responsive, you need to trace back to the early history rather than for the nature of the state itself. It's not the structure of the state. It's really uh, the result of the political process and also the, 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 the nature of the transformation of the post-1989. So that, I think that the, both, we need to think about the, the pattern of the, the democracy in the future, which means that how can we have the, the, the real issue of social justice or the social equality as the, re, the starting point of the renewing or the renovation of democracy. And not only follow the sim simple formalistic view of democracy, but much more integrated. The people can involve in that process, more political process, can involve in to guarantee the more substantial effects of that, the, 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 the democracy. I think that's the, uh, the, the issue that uh, I hope that uh, still the, our gener the la last decades uh, among the Chinese intellectuals, the huge debates happened, uh, the bad side and the good side, but uh, that, that, that the 80s generation played a crucial role still. That's the, uh, the I, I think, that, that the answer of this. Hello. Um, I'd like to challenge a little bit your first answer to Christina's question. Um, because you brought in the argument of the reduction of, of, of poverty that happened in yeah. China as a, as a, as a possible counter-argument uh, against regime change in China. Um, and that was indeed spectacular. Uh, the, the, the scale and scope of this, yeah. of this social transformation is probably unique in, in, yeah. in, in human history. Um, but if we look in, in, in history at some of the um, some of the most successful revolutions, we see that very, very rarely were they uh, the consequence of extreme poverty or impoverishment of, of, or, or lingering into a state of poverty. In most cases, revolutions happen to occur when a recently enriched class loses the confidence. There's mm -hmm. really a, a moment of rupture when, 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 when they, they lose the confidence that yes. the regime, even if it's the, the same regime that actually offered them this opportunity, yeah. Uh, can actually do that for the future. This recently enriched classes have a very short memory and, and uh, quite a low dosage of generosity towards the regimes that provided that yes. uh, impetus. So how, how would this work in the case of China? Yeah, what you mentioned is uh, the old slogans. Uh, Karl Marx once said that uh, the poor people couldn't live as such and the ruling people couldn't leave the... the, 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 the uh, the, the, how to say, to, in that uh, position, no, no longer. So that's the revolution happened. Um, again, I think that uh, these are a lot of, I think that a lot of the symptoms already happened in China. You see, that's why the, uh, no, there was no such a huge mobilization, but protests happened here and there. But what happened, still, I think that the uh, uh, especially the last two years, because of the global crisis. That means that social contradictions and the conflicts deepened in China too. So these are also the hot debates about the so-called Chinese model. Is there such a model or not? These are huge debates among the Chinese intellectuals and, and also as, as well as politicians, I think. They say that the, one of the, the whole issue try to answer this question because 
I think that a lot of people realize the danger of that the certain kind of burst <laughs> could happen, right? And the, 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 the one of them should look back, I, I don't want to repeat too much, but I mentioned a lot in my presentation to talk about the land issues, because it's still a big issue for the debates. For the, the last decades, especially the, after the year 1989, in the, in the late 90s, that uh, there was a trend among the, the mainstream economists, together with the different of, levels of officials, they argue for the necessity of the full privatization of land. On behalf of the efficiency, on behalf of private property rights, and on behalf of the defense of the interest of the poor peasants, because the land grabbing from the developers and the local government was a huge. A lot of the protests happened that. So they want to use the property rights to defend that. But on the other hand, we know that uh, it's also dangerous too. Because the one is that the, after the, the financial crisis, we had uh, in the coastal area, we had a lot huge unemployment in China. Now we have the 25 million unemployment. Let's say that the, after 1949, four generations of Chinese leaders faced each I mean, respectively, the high unemployment reached to the level of the 40 million unemployment. I think for any other country, couldn't manage that unemployment. Why China didn't collapse with that high unemployment? Partly because in the early years, because of certain kind of the uh, system of the countryside and the urban area. So a lot of the labor, surplus labor, were assimilated by the countryside. And now the, the not that level, because a lot of the surplus labor after the financial crisis happened, they went to the hometown because they still had a little bit land, can manage their life based on that land systems. This is the one issue. Secondly, that we know that following these kind of privatization, another aspect is a shrinking of the farming land. China is a huge country with the dense population. If Chinese population heavily depends on the international market of food and the whole global markets will be big change. Now, even now, any, because the Chinese, the, 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 every year, the outcome that uh, from, the, uh, from the, the agriculture will have a huge impact on on the price of the uh, foods in the international markets. So in this way, you certain kind of, the, what kind, on the one hand, you need more because of the market situation, globalization. It's not possible to go back to the early systems. So it's in need a certain kind of the flexibility of the land relations, but not simply allow that the, the, the land system became the uh, merging to the huge landlords and uh, allow a lot of people without, a lot of peasants without the lands, what happened in like a part of the South Asia. That, that could be a real, create a new situation for the revolution. So that's why different kind of the projects for the land reform in this period, in the contemporary context, became quite uh, still very the obvious. So that's why quite interesting that the 19th century, early 20th century, a lot of the theories happened in Europe and Africa, like Henry George, and those people served for the land reform, the theories suddenly re-emerged in the contemporary China for the further, what kind of the idea of the land reform for China. So that's the uh, not certain, I mean, not the, I didn't uh, argue that because of the reduction of poverty that the China will not have that. So because it's an ongoing process. But because of that legacy, you still had a very vibrant debates and a survey for the alternative. I think that's the, uh, where we hope we can come from. It's not uncertain, but certain kind of these kind of the hopes only existed in the consistent the, the, the debates and the survey for these. This is, the, I think, that the, it's the, the my answer. So this is not the clear answer. 
but there's an ongoing process. I'm afraid we have to uh, cut the question and answer session quite short now because um, we're running a bit of time. And thank you again, Professor Wong, for your detailed analysis. And um, we would now go to like a five minute short break and then commence with the next programs with the first, first with the screening of Nick Diocampo's uh, film. So would you, if everyone can come back in five minutes sharp, I would really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much.